Yeah, so what I was asked to speak speak to, um, and being part of the um, reopen committee for the governor, our, um, you know, my area that we did was um, dealing with health care, agriculture, and business and finance, um, primarily on the um, area of the, uh, the committee that I served on. And what we discovered going through that process there several weeks back was that um, the most important thing is, is, um, is to protect our most vulnerable. We have to protect folks that are in nursing homes. We have to protect our long-term care facilities, ALFs, and also people with pre-existing conditions. And if you can protect that group, um, and then the rest of the society could perhaps get back to work with um, enhanced PPE, right? Um, maybe wearing masks, um, you know, into restaurants or into meeting places or to department stores or, or where you're going, um, wearing masks, um, washing your hands, um, the social distancing um, that you've seen going on, and would all be part of this new reopening phase of um, – of our society and in working with the governor we can clearly see the governor has had a, a very what i would say a very confident plan a very good plan um put together um you know to to, to reopen the um, state and he very effectively and quickly shut down things um and in our numbers unfortunately we've had deaths but you know we are you know clearly um you know we've had a lot less um, problems than, than many of our peers in, in other states. So we're at least grateful that, you know, we, we've had less deaths than those original projections, which were many, many, many tens of thousands initially. And um, so I think moving forward, um, I think we will continue to reopen as long as um, we don't have um, any reoccurrences or high spikes. Um, and, and the good part is, is while we're doing all of these things, there are several areas that are continuing to get better. Our, the medicines are getting better, the therapeutic medicines. Um, we are clearly, every day that goes by, um, closer to a vaccine, um, which we probably should have by the end of the year, the first of um, next year at the latest, which is really what's going to get us back to normal is a vaccine. But the, I believe the therapeutic medicines over the coming next two or three or four months will, will continue to improve. And just as if you were to have the flu, the normal flu, you would go to your doctor, they'd probably give you a Tamiflu and they'd send you home. Hopefully there will be a product like that, um, you know, uh, readily available here in the next um, few months for um, the coronavirus. Um, so when you think about um, a few areas I'll talk about, when you think about our agriculture disruptions, our food disruptions, we don't talk about that a lot, but... Um, you know, about half of our food was bought through normal grocery store type outlets, and then the other half were um, through service industry, through restaurants and um, and other service industry type suppliers. And of course, overnight we lost half of our um, the business. And some farmers only did business with the service industry, and of course they lost all of it. So you're you're plowing under you know thousands of acres of um, vegetables that could have went to um, you know, to our uh, to our population, had we had a way to get them there, and but it, tremendous losses and and the supply chain disruptions that that happened in agriculture um, is very sad. And um, but we're working through those issues, the packaging issues, the hauling. We've had great um, participation from I know everyone um, familiar with the public's um, commitment, and they've spent um, hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, packaging and giving away through food through the farm shares. And, and your local farmers have done that also. I mean, a lot of the food that we've um, had that we're going to get plowed under that didn't went through our farm shares and, and some of these most vulnerable and needy um, populations that we've had also. And so you've seen a lot of philanthropic work um, in that area, and, and obviously people have to eat every day to, to stay healthy. And then on the health care, we've now opened up the elective surgeries, um, which was earlier this week. Um, and that's going to hopefully get those hospital systems and everyone working again. Um, and, and, of course, the consideration there is we have to have capacity in case we have a COVID outbreak, outbreak and those hospitals have to be supplied with the proper PPE and, um, and capacity to be able to handle that. So that's part of the considerations of open, opening back up the elective surgeries. But and what I'll say about that on the elective surgery part is not like those aren't necessary surgeries. We've had people in this state in the last two months pass away because of 
you know, some of these elective surgeries not getting done timely. And then we've had lots of people that have had to go in and have these terms. They went from elective to emergency surgeries um, because of um, the need, uh, their need. So elective surgery does not mean not necessary. It means that you're electing your date basically to um, to open up to have your surgery. And so I'm proud that we're getting those um, folks the attention they need. And then you've seen a tremendous drop in um, folks going to their doctors or going to their healthcare centers or, or the emergency room because they're afraid. And so you've got a uh, uptick in people that are passing away at home because of, of that um, um, condition. So when you look at the, the deaths that we've had for, from the coronavirus are attributed to it's normally a comorbidity issue. There were other underlying health concerns in most cases. And um, I'm happy that we're, we're able to get those um, health care centers back open and hospitals back open um, doing the elective surgeries. And, and again, the roadmap that we have today is much different than the view we had two months ago, right? We know now to protect the most vulnerable. We know that that's the population that is, um, is most vulnerable. And, and again, we've produced many um, therapeutic medicines. In addition to that, the testing is ramping up. Um, we are now able to do more of the, the you know, the 45-minute test or the 15-minute test. You're seeing that continuously ramping up. I believe I heard this morning that by the end of this month, countrywide, we should be doing 5 million a day. I believe we're doing 2 to 3 million a day now. And, I mean, that's continuing to ramp up. And that's the key to the long-term success for a reopen is to um, make sure that we can we can test quickly and make sure, just like if you're going to the airport and you're going to fly somewhere, you're probably going to get a 15-minute test at some point in the future when they're readily available for, before you go through the security line. Everyone's going to check temperatures. Everybody's going to have masks. And you're probably, when the quick test becomes readily available, you'll have that also to go through to get on airplanes. But that will give the, our general population the confidence they can go back and do our, um, their business. Um, part three of this was there's a lot of concern about a special session. Um, we are getting um, weekly updates on um, our budgeting process. The CARES Act obviously um, brought in um, billions of dollars to the state of Florida to deal with the COVID virus. Um, the state of Florida also had about $4 billion in reserves to cope with natural disasters. Generally, that would be in the state of Florida would be a hurricane. Obviously, hurricane season starts in about a month. And so normally, we would have those reserves set aside for that type of disaster or whatever came up, obviously, with the COVID virus, those um, resources are available. And I think that as we continue to get our budget updates, surprisingly so far, our budget numbers have been fairly stable. But I believe, you know, by the end of this month, middle of June, we will know the full extent of the, the damage um, to our budget. And we may have to go in a special session in June to um, deal with that. Part of the answer is going to come from, I believe, what they're calling phase four at the federal level. They know they're going to have to put some resources together to backfill state and um, local budgets. And I know they're working on that now. So if our federal government, depending on how that package looks, could also determine whether or not um, we're going to have to go into a special session to adjust the budget. And then lastly, if it's, you know, it's a shallower budget um, deficit than we than we believe, then um, the governor obviously has a line item veto, and he could um, remove you know four five six hundred million dollars out of that budget, or maybe even more if necessary. Um, not and and then we would not have to have a special session also. So I I do not believe that a special session is a certainty, but that it is um, we need more information before we will um, know if that's going to be um, necessary or not. And and so as we get updates weekly right now, we're encouraged. But again, 30 days, 45 days from now, that outlook could completely change. And depending on how the federal government um, handles this, that also could completely change. So that's sort of the update. I apologize for this, you know, getting on the phone 20 minutes late from technology here, but i um, happy to try to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Senator. We really appreciate you, you being here with us and thank you for your remarks. and your insight into what's going on at, at the state level. We do have the opportunity to take questions from our attendees. Please remember to type your questions into the Q&A box in your control panel. And while those questions are coming in, Senator, you spoke a, 
briefly about the budget and obviously unprecedented times we we understand that that everyone at the state level is monitoring those situations very closely do you see any um potential uh, new revenue or increased emphasis on things like the compact with the Seminole tribe or uh, tax loopholes on online retailers? Are there things that, that are being contemplated for ways to make up any shortfall? I think when you look at, yeah, the answer is yes to all of the above. Um, yeah, yeah, two years ago, year and a half ago, I had worked out a, um, I was tasked with working out an agreement with the um, Seminole Tribe to rework the compact. Um, we were actually successful in that um, effort. Um, and then we, because we were at the end of session, um, we did not end up, you know, with the education process of going through with the governor's office and the house, we were not able to get that done this, that, that year. And then um, this last year, um, it did not materialize. Um, it just, um, I did not work on it this last year, but the, the compact did not materialize. And it was always something that we knew that we needed to get done. Um, the, the Seminole, the, the tribe has been a very good partner of the state of Florida, Florida. And, um, and the new compact would bring in well in excess of $500 million a year in normal times. Clearly, if we had a compact today, you know, there would be, we would, you know, the, the, they, we've shut down the casinos or the tribe has shut down their casinos. And so there would probably be no revenues right now coming in, but that's something that we definitely need to continue to look at. It's something I'm very interested in. And I found them to be very honorable in their, um, you know, in their negotiations with us. So I don't, I don't see any reason why we can't get that done. And that definitely is, would be on the table. I don't know if that would be on the table for a special session, um, but certainly um, coming into early next year, it's something we're very interested in and and getting that um, put together. So that's a that is a um, one issue. The online loophole, the Wayfair bill, I think we called it. Um, Senator Gruders was running that bill. Certainly, that's something I've supported uh, my entire career. Um, we you know we disadvantage our hometown retailers um, that are paying for all of our you know critical services, right? Um, our ad valorem pays for education and a lot of our law enforcement and, and first responders. And um, it's something we need to do. Um, it's something that uh, I am personally um, for, and it's something that you know I'd look forward to trying to get that through the Senate also. So there are some of those things that could be helpful, and it's some, some of the ways that we're hopefully going to um, take advantage of you know, starting next year. Thank you, Senator. Um, maybe I'll switch focus a bit to the, the unemployment process. We've all seen some of the, the issues that have arisen with the unemployment process. We've got some great private companies in town, such as Sykes that manages large call centers worldwide. How can folks like that help through navigation of this process? Or have we thought about going to a more private way to deal with some of these uh, state issues? You know, um, I'm, it, I'm glad you asked that question. I normally would have mentioned that earlier, but I was trying to condense my talk or you know engagement because of the time. But but the reality is is that I was in the Senate, have been in the Senate the last eight years, and about five years ago, we the at the time the governor's office, um, Governor Scott's office, had come in and said, "We need this new system. It's bringing us into the 21st century." We had six or eight employees that wrote the code on the old system because there was no one else that could do the code. So the state of Florida actually had code writers that was only experts at that, the old system's code um, to do that work. And it, you know, it's ridiculous. And so we were very pleased with the fact that we were updating the system and $77 million um, went into that, I believe it was. And then of course, the first month that it opened was a disaster as it was switching over the, from the old system to the new system. And, but they worked that out relatively quickly. But we were working from a very low base of unemployed at that time, very, very low base. Mm -hmm. And so we were told back then that this was not – we were never under the imagination that we would have a million people in two weeks apply for unemployment, right? In other words, there was no, nothing like that. But this was a 21st century um, technology and could ramp up and down and under normal circumstances actually may have done its job. With that said, what we were sold back then is not what we are now seeing. 
And of course, when you've seen, you know, over a million um, people come into that system, it, it overloaded the system and it crashed. And then as we were trying to, the governor's team and DEO was trying to go through and, um, and correct those um, technicalities, um, there was dozens of them in the, in the area. Like you couldn't backdate it. If you backdated it, it would throw something out or it would, a fraud alert. And so there was all types of problems with the with this system that we are now getting through and the governor immediately assembled and I mean hundreds of staffers and team members around the state to to try to do this um, to get this unwound they've made a tremendous progress and we believe that maybe by the end of next week we will have substantially gotten through a lot of those um, the, through, the, through the backlog and it will take months and maybe a year before we actually can go back and look through that entire system to see all the problems and all the fallacies. The good part was is obviously the claims will be retroactive so that once people can get in the system, they will receive the, the full entitlement that um, they were they were due. But there's no excuse for a system that we were sold that was supposed to be in the 21st century to have created this problem. There's just no excuse for that. Even the notion that maybe 40% of the people that were signing into it were not entitled to unemployment not all of the things that went wrong there was we we've got a very bad system here and um and look we're we've got plenty of time now on this um we're going to have our team look at what we were sold versus what we got and we're going to hold that company responsible one way or the other and um, the legislature will hold them responsible and i know the governor's team is looking forward to holding them responsible so we thought we did the right thing and and you know we we bought a bill of goods uh, we appreciate everything you're doing on that on that front, Senator. Um, as we continue our, our reopening, and we appreciate everything that, that you and the executive branch have done to help us reopen businesses, has there been any um, thought about how to help insulate businesses from liability if they comply with CDC guidelines and with the governor's mandates? Yeah, um, there there has been some thought on it. And I know the um, in in the fed at the federal government level, they are looking at this on, on what they were called their phase four, and so they're looking at um, how can we protect businesses that are doing the right things, right? And like you're saying, if you comply with CDC and um, and in your the states um, mandates, because um, we're all a little different, each of the states, um, that's one step. And I believe they may get something done on that. They're saying that they will get something done on that. Um, by the end of this month, um, normally if you wait on the federal government, though, you're you're in a really bad place because <laughs> they do very little. Um, then when you come down to the state level, our first opportunity to do some of that would probably be in um, the form of next session. And it's something that we're very interested in. I believe you will see a lot of cottage industries pop up um, to sue people um, if we don't do anything. And um, so it's something that we are putting some thought into now, but we're not trying to get ahead of what the federal government may do and or what the governor may do, you know, with an executive order. So we're, we've got plenty of time to go through that, but it's something we're very interested in to make sure that we don't, you know, um, hamstring the reopen and, and, and our businesses that are clearly, you know, maybe even in a position where they don't want to reopen because of that liability. It's something that I hope the federal government will do right away. That's the right thing to do. And then um, I'm, I'm certain the governor's team is reviewing his options also. That, that surely makes sense on, on that plan. Uh, any insight on into when we may be at a, a further progression in stages of reopening? I'm sorry, say that again. Any, any insight as to when we could expect further stages of reopening? Yeah, so the governor made it very clear on the reopening that he was not going to allow a calendar to dictate that time frame. In other words, he just wasn't going to say every seven days or 10 days or 14 days that he was going to do anything. And um, so I think that as we are getting to the words end of this week, um, we will have been 14 days from the first opening by Monday. And I think the governor's team is continuously, just as we open um, barbershops and 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 so on um cosmetologists uh, monday i think he's continually 
continuously reviewing that. I believe the three counties in South Florida are planning on their soft open for this coming Monday. And, um, and so I believe the governor is not only continuously reviewing it, I think he's trying to be thoughtful considering all the evidence on the opening. So I think you will, in the next few weeks, I think there'll be many more openings as long as the numbers continue to stay stable um, in our system. Yeah, the data-driven approach definitely seems to yep. uh, be one that, that should be followed in, in that arena for sure. Um, yeah, safety is, is number one, right? And, and the safety of our population, we clearly have to – and safety doesn't mean just safety for health. We have to consider business and the safety of people that are that are in their homes, right? We, we know that we assume – or we, I say we assume, but, you know, domestic violence is probably much higher. Child abuse, you've got all kinds of things to consider as you're thinking about um, um, reopening, and, and these things are all very important, and we need to get people back to being able to earn a living, and, and we need to do it safely. But I think now the, you know, the, the evidence is, is that we're doing a lot of things. We know how to do that, and now we need our population to become comfortable with that, with the right PPE and the right um, social distancing and things. And so I think the ingredients are there um, to continue to open at a gradual pace, and what I've told folks is, is it's like getting on a car. If you stopped on the interstate and you take off, you're going to get up to 70 miles an hour eventually. You know, maybe right now we're at 20 or 25 miles an hour, right? And we're going to gradually increase up to 70. And um, and I think the process will continue to unroll. And, and in addition to that, what's going to continue to allow that is the additional testing and the additional therapeutic medicines. Those are the things that are going to be key to continuing to open up more and more, and those things are getting better, and that's allowing the you know the data to drive it. Senator, can you uh, give us a little more insight onto into um, contact tracing? Um, I think that with the influx of you know AI and artificial intelligence and and various ways to maximize technology, it seems as though that model has helped. Um, determine areas that might be a little hotter than others. Um, I know we have a lot of local companies in the Tampa Bay region that, that work in that arena. Uh, any any other thoughts for us on on contact tracing? The um, we've been waiting. It just I, I've seen a, obviously the news stories and I've seen the, the press that's available on these things. I think contract tracing can be a very important part of the overall health of our system. I, I think more importantly, and I think contact tracing is going to be a very important part of it. I think the most important part of it, though, is going to be to, as we protect the most vulnerable, is that as you go into the nursing homes, ALS, you know, the employees that go in there that are from the outside, they may end up being tested every day when they go in. So that when you get to work, that may be part of the, um, the protocol is that you would get tested. It's like our students going back to the universities. As they go into the universities, I know some of them are planning to bring in several thousand a day or or as many, you know, to do the rapid test. So they get there, they temperature check them, they rapid test them, and then you've got to, then you're in, right? You're, and then I know you'll do the, the antibody testing will become a lot more um, common in the next 30 days. And um, so it, I think testing is key. And then, obviously, contact um, tracing is um, is the next step. And I think that's a little more tricky because people um, love their privacy and and they do not want technology to be able to track them everywhere they've been, although it already does through the cell phones and other devices. Um, but I think that it's um, I think contact tracing is something the executive team is working on in the governor's office to make sure that we have the right system in place to do that. But I my my personal thought is is the the rapid testing and multiple tests. Like I said, if you go to work five days a week in a nursing home, you may get tested all five days unless you have the antibody and, you know, are now in a position where you can um, move around. And, and the problem is, is everything we're saying here today is subject to be different in two to four weeks from now because the technology will be still that much better in testing and we'll have that much better opportunity. So, Remember, everything we're talking about here today is subject to be different based on new technologies and new therapeutic medicines. 
Yeah, no doubt. We've all had to caution that that our guidance is as good as kind of the hour, minute, and almost second that we're uh, reading it and and relaying it. Senator, you touched a, a bit there on the college uh, system, the state university system. As we begin to reopen, my thoughts can't help but turn to college football. Uh, any any insight for us on what may happen come the fall? You know, um, we're all hopeful that by the fall we would have um, a, um, a vaccine or we'll have um, some really good therapeutic medicines to help us get through that. And um, anything that we would say about college football today certainly would be um, looking into a crystal ball. But I believe that uh, as the athletes come back into the systems, they will continuously be um, tested, um, maybe even on a daily basis. Certainly their temperatures will be checked and, and all of the safety precautions for those athletes. Um, and it, I think if we believe we have a good handle on that, I think you're going to see Major League Baseball open, I think they said July the 1st. So in other, we will have a pattern of how the professional athletes are handling it. I presume that the college athletes will have a very similar system on um, checking, you know, the, all the vital signs that you have to do every, on a daily basis and perhaps a COVID test every day until there is a um, vaccine as they're um, doing that. And then I believe what I'm hopeful of is that there will be a, some availability of live seating and maybe it'll be 20% or maybe it'll be 50% or 30%. And of course, you'll when you go to the football game today or a basketball game, you're going to have to get your temperature checked. There's going to be things that will happen as you go into the stadium. You may be, um, you may have to wear a mask. You, and and so I think the the I think we have the ability to do it. I think now we have to allow our society's comfort level to catch up with the fact that if you're wearing a mask, if everybody's getting temperature checked, um, or maybe even COVID um, check, you know, as they go in, depending on how the testing ramps up. I think there are possibilities of us having a college football season. And I, I would put it at probably 70% at this point, because I believe we've got the best pharmaceutical industry in the world in this, in the, in the USA and, and all over the world, they're working for vaccines all over the world. I should, it's not just us, but we have the best in the world. I believe three months from now, we will be in a substantially different place not only on testing, but contact tracing and and what the protocol would be to go to some type of an event like that. But I would say as a cautionary note that that will be the last types of things we will get to do again. Going to concerts, football games, big arenas will probably be one of the last things that will open up as we try to get back to our normal um, lifestyle. Sure, I like your odds and, and, and I hope we I hope we get there. Uh, obviously, this pandemic has been transformative in the way we all look at healthcare and our healthcare providers. Uh, there are our heroes of of the day, and we we thank all of them for what they've been doing. Has this pandemic changed your mindset on how uh, healthcare should be handled from a budgetary standpoint within the state? Yeah, and you know that's a very very good question. And um, I know we've passed we passed a lot of um, bills in the last two or three years dealing with telemedicine, dealing with um, um, scope um, of practice, um, you know, for nurse practitioners and other um, on other issues with um, health care. And I think what you'll see is you will see some permanent changes that come from having to deal with the pandemic to our healthcare care system. I think you'll see more telemedicine and uh, more I'd be more ideas of telemedicine. I also think you'll see a and a, a, a technology has already been a, exploding in this area, right? You can wear a watch now that it can keep up with your an EKG or your heartbeat and, and all the things that you can do through technology. As those two things continue to improve, I think you're going to see a lot more of the um, um, healthcare turn to telemedicine, and um, which is much better for the patient if, um, if it's appropriate. And of course, I'm not a doctor. I'm, you're getting an egg farmer's opinion, by the way, not a doctor's. But it, you know, having not to have to go into your doctor's office um, for routine visits is a, I think, is a quality of life issue that a lot of our folks would have. On the payment um, side of it, I know that there are, um, you know, there are ways to take advantage of um, federal funding to maximize our federal funding in our healthcare system, and we are looking at several ways to do that now. And it's something I've been interested in, you know, my, my career in the Senate, but did not gain a lot of support. Um, 
And so we, we're, we're looking at that. We're going to have a team of healthcare experts um, work with us along with those associations in that field um, to, to help us maximize um, Florida's um, healthcare industry's returns from the, the resources from the federal government. You know, Florida being one of the 14 states that hasn't dealt with Medicaid expansion, do you think this is a time to relook at that issue? I, um, if under certain circumstances. So a when we did this in the Florida Senate three or four years ago, there were there, the system was is that we were essentially going to privatize the options for able-bodied working adults that um, you know could not be in the Medicaid system. And so when you're talking about expanding Medicaid, as long as you put it in the sentence with re the reforms that would be necessary, that's that's two different things. So a pure expansion of Medicaid, I would say no. But when you if you look at um, the ideals of work requirements, education requirements, um, co-pays, um, letting private insurers um, handle the system so that you're not in a government-run system, but you're on a system to where I'm, if I'm in Medicaid, I'm buying my plan. I'm the money that I'm allotted each month. I can put into a health savings account that I will help pay my deductibles. I think anything we can do to the, engage the population on their health care options makes it much better. When you have a government-run program where people there's an, this entitlement part of it, and I'm talking about Medicaid specifically, not Medicare. Medicare has been a great system for many years, and, and our seniors have earned that through a life of work. On Medicaid, um, which is mostly taking care of our most vulnerable, they can't do for themselves, they should be in a system that is um, that treats them with that same respect. People that can't do for themselves, our most vulnerable, should be taken care of. If you have the ability to work, if you have the ability to, to go out and earn, earn part of this, then, um, then that should be part of the requirement too. So I think as you look at uh, Medicaid in the future, um, is I, would, I am for more of a, the patients in the Medicaid system who can, the people that are in there that can take more responsibility for themselves, um, I think we should do that, even with the state dollars that go towards paying that. And so the, you know, that would be more of the way I would look at it um, if given the opportunity. Senator, we got a, a unique opportunity coming up with uh, both yourself taking over the helm at the Senate and and uh, with Representative Sprouls coming in as the speaker designate. What did, what does that do for us as as a region? <laughs> you know, um, we'll see, right? Um, I've lived here all my life. I think um, Speaker Sprouls has lived here most of his life or all of it, and um, we're very proud to be a part of the Tampa Bay area. And um, I grew up in pa East Pasco County, which is a, a more rural area, but um, have been going to Tampa again all of my, you know, from all of my life. I think we have a good opportunity as it relates to our our local infrastructure here, our our water resources, our environment that we've done so much work on in the last eight years, um, the road infrastructure, the T-BARDA infrastructure to be able to to move people around, making sure that our area of the state. Um, has looked at, you know, and we look at the whole state, right? We, we represent the whole state, but when you look at our area, we want to make sure that we're prepared for those 21st century jobs and the, and, and the way you do that. And, and one of the ways you do that is you have the best education system, you know, in the, in the United States or in the world. And I believe we do have, we clearly have the best university and community college structure in the United States three years in a row, um, it, which is by World News Report rankings. I believe our K-12 system, when you get more parental involvement and parental choices, um, has uh, has greatly improved, and I, we're in the top, you know, in the United States on the K-12 system. Last year, we were very proud of the fact that we were raising our um, minimum teacher pay, starting teacher pay, to $47,500, which would put us number two in the country um, for our teachers so that we can recruit and retain the best and brightest teachers. So I think when you look at the state and the Tampa Bay area, we're looking to make sure that we're the model to where if someone wants to bring jobs, they want to come here. We have the right resources, meaning the right infrastructure, roads. Water has clearly been a major issue, not only in the Tampa Bay area for the last 50 years, but it, countrywide, it's, it's the top issue. Can we have clean, potable drinking water? 
and be able to have the tourists that come back and be able to enjoy our beaches and our springs and watersheds and, and environments. And so I think you'll see a lot of emphasis, not only in the Tampa Bay area on those areas, and we're very proud of USF um, and the accomplishments and the strides they're making to get to the top 20. Um, University of Florida is in the top 10. I think Florida State's in the top 20. And um, USF is coming up very rapidly um, to get in the top 20. And so as you continue to produce more and more of those type of universities, it's going to continue to bear fruit in our area. Yeah, and, and we have great educational, um, especially the higher education like St. Leo's in your backyard, uh, who does a fantastic job, University of Tampa. So uh, a lot of good a lot of good resources on education. I think, as you said, infrastructure, natural resources, education, so so important to, to our state. Senators, you uh, prepare to take the reins. What are going to be the critical issues that you're going to champion uh, for us in Tallahassee? Um, part of the uh, things that I um, talked about last year was, um, you know, the process of take, making sure we're taking care of our most vulnerable children that need to be adopted or fostered. And I, we did some really good work this last year, um, did a few bills that um, helped to speed up those processes and get a little bit of the red tape out of the way. I think we're going to continue to look at that group. I always, again, say, you know, rising tide lifts all boats but you have to make sure the boat's in the water. And um, when you think about, um, you know, our foster care system um, and our adoption system, I think in some ways, and by the way, people are working very hard on these things every day. They need better tools to work with. And I think this last year we gave them some better tools and some resources, and I hope to continue to work in that space some more. Um, when you think about our water resources and our environment, um, you know, that is at the at the top of my list. When you think about it, as being someone from agriculture, um, we need water for the population growth, right? We're going to have 30 million people living here in probably another 15 years. So we have the population growth continuing. We have agriculture, which we, um, don't, know, we don't always see that every day. It doesn't seem to hit our radar screen. It's actually the currently the leading driver of the economy. But we have to eat every day. We need to make sure that agriculture has a place in Florida and in North America. And so I think it's very important to work on those water resources and the environment as it relates to those issues, spring sheds, waterways. And so if we can take care of, of those areas, um, and then I think we're going to have a unique opportunity because of the pandemic to look at maybe a Medicaid block grant, right, to where we would do a Florida program rather than this national one-size-fits-all type program. So I think you're going to see a lot of movement in healthcare. I think clearly we're going to continue the record we've had the last eight years of continuing to clean up the Everglades and our spring sheds and waterways, and which is and the dynamic growth is happening, right? People are going to move, you know, they were moving at a rate of a thousand a day um, pre-pandemic. I presume that by the middle of next year we'll be back up to that kind of a number again. So um, those are the things that are going to be a little be important to to me as we move forward. Yeah, no doubt, Senator. I think if you've ever snorkeled with a, a baby manatee up at Three Sisters, you get a unique, um, just a, a, a really u unique feeling for how how precious those those natural springs and, and our natural resources are, and and obviously our, our kids and and our food resources are are critical. Senator, thank you yeah, so no, much for yep. for being with us today. Go ahead, sir. I, would, uh, I was going to say thank you for having me, and thank you for bringing up Three Sisters. I, I represent Citrus County, so we've done tremendous work. If anyone wants to look up what we're doing there at Kings Bay and Homosassa and the septic to sewer programs. Um, and by the way, the, the septic to sewer is obviously part of that water quality issue I was just mentioning. We've done a tremendous amount of work in that area, but we are, you know, it's, it'll, it'll take 20 years to, to right those wrongs. And um, but we're working on all those. If if anyone on the call wants to look up the Kings Bay restoration, what's happened in the last five, six, seven years there has really been tremendous, and I'm um, very proud of that. So thank you for having me today. Again, Senator, thank you so much. We really appreciate you being with us today, and thank you for everyone that's uh, gotten on and, and joined us today. We hope that uh, you find our, our information and resources uh, valuable, and thanks for being part of the Tampa Bay Chamber. Y'all be safe and have a great yep. day. You too.